Good afternoon and welcome uh, to the uh, Academic and Student Services Work Session, December 1st, 2016. Uh, let's begin, if we could, with a moment of silence. Thank you. So, board members, we do not have anybody signed up to speak. So, the next uh, item is agenda review and approval. Move approval. Second. Any discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Passes, thank you. And so we have two major topics uh, tonight. Oh, we did not do the minutes. We, yes, thank you. Agenda minutes. I should have put on my glasses. Sorry. <laughs> uh, so we need uh, we need to approve the minutes. Move to approve the minutes from November third. Second. Any questions, changes to the minutes? Uh, all in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed? All right, passes, thank you. Now that brings us to uh, two pieces. They're both large items. Uh, and so I'm sure that we'll have robust discussion. Uh, the first is English as a second language. And uh, the second is the high school data. Good afternoon. Thanks for joining us. Let's let's uh, we're ready to roll. Oh yeah, if you could turn on your mic, and if you could turn on your microphone as well, please. Okay. Great, thank you. Program goal. Becky, it's not. Oh. No, it's not. That's why it's not working. Okay. Maybe it was more for the online presentation. Fine, but okay. Sure. Online. Sure. Um, so it's. <laughs> It's to ensure the um, growth of academic language proficiency by uh, aligning instruction to language proficiency and making sure that they have content um, uh, proficiency differentiated for them. Establish a baseline of growth in their language proficiency assessments by a .5 or a move up by one level at the end of each year based on their state English language proficiency assessments. Um, it's also about increasing the participation in professional development, particularly where it pertains to um, our recent arrivals and collaborate strategically with our community partners um, to support the students and families in Durham Public Schools. This is just a snapshot of um, some of our demographic information. We have 10,095 students that speak a language other than English at home. Um, number of DPS students who speak Spanish are 8,339. And we have 4,700, little over 4,700 and counting English learners uh, identified in the district. 
number of languages that are represented are 83. And the last category, the number of DPS students who are recent immigrants that is within three years in US schools, we have 1,174 English learners and 107 others who are non-English learners. These could be kids who are from English-speaking countries such as Nigeria, Australia, and England. Um, but they do qualify for their first three years if we increase by a certain percentage for additional funding from the federal government. Before you go on to the next slide, um, help me on, I, I want to understand this a little bit better. So is the top number, how, how does the second and third numbers relate to the top number? Okay, so the top number includes speakers of multiple languages. It could be Spanish, as you can see with the next one, is the, is the bulk of the 10,095. Right. So the other couple of thousand are something Arabic else, and else, Burmese right. and Swahili and so forth. Okay. The English learners are those who are identified by English language proficiency testing, which we have, which we are required to administer to every student who has a language other than English spoken at home. Okay. So um, does that forty-seven hundred? Uh huh. It, it, that's just a subset of the 10,000, or is that a yes, subset? Yes, that's a subset of 10,000. So in other words, over the 4,700, the others, they speak another language, but they're proficient in, in English, English. Okay, and okay. they do not need English learner service. Okay, thank you, thank you. I'm glad you brought that up. I think that's a very important distinction, because um, when you look at the first number, you don't have any idea of how many of them are not proficient in English, you know, Many people speak several languages. I took German and French, and I speak English. <laughs> so um, it's, good, it's, it's good to have that differentiation. Because I, I, I've, I've talked to a student who said, I was getting on him one day about not practicing his instrument enough. He said, my homework takes me longer because English is not my language. I'm like, OK, but still <laughs> practice. Thank you. Um, this is just a quick snapshot of our elementary numbers by school. So as you can see, Forest View tops the with over 200 identified English learners, and then followed by Holt, and then we have Creekside. So it's just like a quick visual for you to look at our elementary. This is our middle school. Our highest numbers are about 129 at Githams, and then followed by um, uh, Carrington, Brogdon, Neil. And here are our high schools, topped with Riverside and Jordan having the highest numbers, and then followed by um, Southern and Northern and um, Hillside, which kind of go with the same, around the same area between 140, 150, 120, and so forth. Why do you think there's a dis Dispar such a disparity between the specialty schools and the traditional schools? Is it um, just a not knowing the process or? A lot of it's when they, that they arrive at the beginning of a school year. Right, okay. And so the lottery has already taken place. Right. Okay. And, and, and we also know that our uh, Latino parents came in and asked for a bit, you know, a more, right. um, streamlined and more friendly way of doing it. So I think that's a factor. But I think more, more of the factor is when they arrive. Okay. This is some of the graduation information we have for our high schools. Um, I've got two subgroups here, the Hispanic subgroup and the LEP subgroup, to be known as English learners uh, in the future. Um, but the denominator is on your left most column with the numerator and the comparison of two years and the percent. As you will see, there's a growth in the Hispanic subgroup's graduation rate of 5.1%. Uh, and in the LEP subgroup, it is 8.3%. So. so are those numbers, sorry, the, the denominator is the total number of students and then the numerator the, is the number that graduated? 
the, the, those are the 12th graders who graduate, yeah. Okay. Do you know, do you know the year prior off the top of your head? 13, 14? For either? I'm sorry, I can look it up. Okay, it's I mean, enough uh, to you find. know, just one year isn't, doesn't necessarily show a trend. I mean, it shows an improvement, but it doesn't show a trend. Right. And we did, we had something which we had actually a five year um, growth one, so I, c I can always pull that information up past this. That'd be great, thank you. Here are some of the supports for uh, student success that we have in place in Durham Public Schools. So a quick um, snapshot of that again. Instructional, uh, for instructional supports, we've got um, our instructional models are designed based on language proficiency of our students to support various language levels. We also have extended learning opportunities during the summer for uh, mostly for our newcomers. And then there's coaching um, for both ESL teachers as well as classroom teachers that have a high um, ESL population um, additionally for them. And this is new as of the last two years, is actually two years old. Um, additionally, we've also provided some supplemental um, newcomer positions to schools as, and some resources with the schools that have been receiving the most number of um, new students. In terms of professional development, we've developed training for both classroom teachers and ESL teachers on content-based literacy. We've created diversity training, which is required by every one in the district that interfaces with parents. We've also identified some master teachers to support uh, professional development both at their schools and they're on extended contract so they can be invited to other schools to provide PD as well. And we've also created some supplemental mentoring for our new ASL teachers. So they get district mentoring anyway and then they have content mentoring by master ESL teachers. Um, in terms of family outreach, we've established through our ESL Resource Center uh, an orientation and a welcome process for to Durham Public Schools where we enroll our students. We've also, through that ESL Resource Center, have been able to strengthen communication between um, um, schools and families and um, established a parent education program modules for that are by DPS staff. Some of them are administered by community partners as well as some of our local universities, Duke being our biggest partner. Do we have any sense of how many parents are participating in those? We have sign-in sheets for them, but for a lot of our um, groups, they're done at schools. So schools invite us as well and uh, uh, for their Title I night, so some of them is funneled that way. And then what we do at the district level, there are times when we have standing room only in M1, which could be anywhere from 150 to 200 families. So uh, it varies, but we get a very good turnout. The schools inviting you is, I, mean, I feel like it kind of cuts both ways. I mean, one, you're responding to a need, and at the same time, it's not, you're pushing into schools that may have high um, percentages of English language learner families. Um, It's not a question. Um, yeah, on that point, um, with the parent education sessions, are these one-shot deals that kind of come up every now and then, or are they consistent meetings, like monthly or quarterly? Or so we have we have uh, middle and high school transition, for example, which occur every year. We do one which piggybacks with whatever the district is doing, but we offer supplemental sessions just for our. Um, families that need the extra support. Uh, for instance, December 6th, we're gonna have um, small high school orientation. So all our families have been invited to come to that and they will get their information. It's very well organized. We have a student panel and so families hear from students who have been through this. They, they, we hear through, um, we have the pres uh, principals come and present uh, highlights about their school. So it's very well it's, uh, attended. And at every event, we have book giveaways uh, because that's also a book harvest um, center at the resource center. And um, summer, so most of them are annual events 
that we have every once in a while, but additionally, we go to the schools. Sometimes it's a school invitation, sometimes it's just something that we ask, would, we, would you like this? We have a K-5 module for literacy and math and how, you, how families can work with literacy and math with their students. So that's one example. I have a question about the diversity training. Uh -huh. I feel like that word is very broad. It can mean lots of different things. So can you tell us a little bit more about what you're doing with staff to help them prepare them to work with families? So the diversity training is really um, wor both working with families, but to understand families um, in terms of can they help their kids with homework, you know, and things like that. But most of that training is about how do you work with your students in the classroom and, um, and things like that. And it's online. It's a very short one right now, but we do have additional uh, trainings that uh, occur. And, and schools have also invited outside um, agencies to be able to conduct more diversity training at their schools. So is that majority teachers that are going to that training? or that Teachers. Non-instructional staff at the schools, front office staff, um, bus drivers, cafeteria employees, um, anyone who interacts with our students and with parents directly are required to have that training. Some of our challenges. Um, we have a high number of students who have little or interrupted schooling. And a high number of students who are overage in our high schools. And so the overage kids are also the same kids who have had little or no schooling in recent years. And so that, those are our two biggest challenges at this point. What's, uh, what's the challenge with the overage? Why does, why does that present an extra challenge? Because they're overage and also um, some of them pre-literate. So we have to enroll them in high school because they're 18, sometimes 19. Can't put them in a, you know, a lower a grade level. But they have not had education beyond second grade or even less. And so it's, they're older, but they've, they're pre-literate. And they're still held to the same graduation standards that every other student so I, I feel like I'm hearing more it's about late arrival than they've been with us for a long time and they're pushing into 18, 19. Where you right. Yeah. So the overage okay. kids are the, the recent arrivals who are overage and who are under, um, who are pre-literate. Do we have any sense of how many students we're talking about? For the overage students, when I last checked, we have 97 students who are 16 or above and in ninth grade, and who are recent arrivals in the, the, in the last two years in US schools. And, and of those, how many would you estimate are considered little or interrupted schooling? Um, I would almost say at least almost all of them. Um, it's hard because there's no of the nine. Of, the, of, of those the 97, 97, yeah, right. almost all of them. Okay. Right, and they come from Central America, many of them, and they're also the ones from DRC are the ones who are coming with very little. They've not been to school before. Um, you know, they, they don't even know how a light switch works and things like that. And, and, so, so, and so have we looked at alternatives to placing them in regular high schools? We're exploring Because Because I, I know I've heard from teachers how challenging it is. Yes. Yeah, we have to put them someplace. They're in a room, they're reading at a third grade level, they're 17 years old, they've just been through a war zone, and you're supposed to teach them physical science. Yep. Uh, so, and so teachers have been asking, you know, are, are there alternatives to, to this, because it doesn't seem to be working for anybody. Right, so we are exploring those options, and currently what we've done, which I've, I think I have that in your handouts as well, is uh, to look at the school within the school. When we got this, January 2014, we had a lot of our students who, they were just coming in droves, and all of a sudden between January and March, we had 300 high school students who came um, under in that crisis mode. 
And so by then, all we could do was look at where the highest uh, numbers were going to and provide them the additional newcomer supports and resources to be able to kind of do a school within a school schedule and model until we can come up with a uh, good plan. But we are exploring all those options. Do you have a sense of when, when we would be looking at alternative options? Like by next school year or? Is we will look at some alternative options next school year because we want to be in kind of the budget cycle because it will have an impact on anything we do differently. We'll have to begin to look at how will we pay for it. And so we will have our plan to be within the budget cycle. Um, so some of the com community partner support uh, are in the areas of mental health and counseling services. That is our high need. And uh, we have been partnering with Carolina Outreach and El Futuro. But again, those are the two agencies that have been doing it and we have higher needs. Um, also to be able to provide some multiple options to some of our uh, overage high school students, such as apprenticeships or job skills training, to make it very relevant and include that as part of student engagement. Our other high need is um, qualified bilingual and or biculturally competent counselors and social workers to have certified, qualified bilingual social workers. It's a very high need area for us. So some of our program enhancements that we have in process are uh, collaborating with school districts about enhancing our newcomer services, garner feedback uh, on the 22 credit graduation option for a high school from high school principals, which will happen on December 6th. Um, just speaking to that a little bit, this is for the students who come to us who've had grade level education, but they have not been able to come to us with transcripts. And so we have to place them in ninth grade because we don't have a transcript to go with to place them in upper grades. So for them to look at, I've finished 10th grade, but now I'm going back to ninth grade and I have another four years to go, we're trying to come up with a plan for them to be able to accelerate the graduation process by state guidelines. And then we're also exploring a middle school um, program audit because that's again an area where in our EOGs as well as language proficiency, we are looking toward more growth. And we ha that's where we flatline some. Sashi, is the work uh, collaborating with other school districts? Are you having joint programs or are you looking what other school districts are doing for newcomer centers? We're looking at what other school districts are doing for newcomer centers. We're looking into um, options of what they're doing with both school within a school as well as separate school models. Charlotte and Guildford, New York City schools as well. So how do we, uh, going back to just the different languages that are in the schools or the, uh, the students are coming with, uh, how do we handle uh, languages that we might not have translators for? Uh, I went to Githens a while back and I um, was walking around with Miss Williams and the class of newcomers came walking by. And she said, yeah, we had like three people come from, I can't remember where it was from, but it wasn't a Latin American country. It was, it was somewhere that maybe it was Swahili was the language or something like that. Mm -hmm. And so I'm curious, that how, do we, how do we handle that type of situation, you know, when there's just not a traditional translator or language? So are you referring to how we teach the students? Yeah, yeah. So you teach students, our job is to teach them English. And uh, we want teachers who are trained in understanding how to work with second language learners regardless of the language. And a lot of it goes back to some linguistic, that, that comes in teacher training with learning how different languages operate and trying to be able to capitalize on their native language to um, promote English learning. So. That's a follow-up question, because I think the next part of that question is that uh, what happens when an, uh, um, a parent who comes in who speaks Arabic? Okay, so so for that we do have um, a contract with a translation agency; they're local, and uh, we have uh, telephone interpreting as an option. Johnny fell on the playground, and mom needs to come and get him. We have a telephone interpreter that 
is available 24-7 through this agency. And uh, in terms of face-to-face -face or if there's a parent event, then we do hire um, different language groups. And um, the, yesterday there was an event at Jordan High School and we had about seven language groups there and they were able to come. They got a little orientation of what it's like to be at Jordan, what the attendance requirements are, what some of the discipline um, expectations are, and then they were able to down, you know, get a schedule. Parents were able to understand that part of it, as well as some of the progress reports, and were able to look up grades on PowerSchool. So, just an example. I think that's us. Yeah. What? Uh, are there other questions? Could, could I follow up kind of with Steve? If we can go back to the challenges and areas of need slide. Um, yeah. So Steve, you, you kind of asked about alternatives. Um, I'd like to ask what, what are we doing about the bottom one there? Um, what's, what's our action plan? Um, for finding, recruiting, training um, bilingual, bicultural staff? So this is about finding um, qualified counselors and social workers. Human Resources has been working on, you know, putting that as one of the, they've got it on, it's on the radar of Human Resources in terms of when we're recruiting. It's so one of those high needs things. areas. Yes. Like we have come, you know, to learn about the math and the science, the bilingual, particularly the um, Spanish speaking, is one of those that that's an area now that is of high needs. And so we collaborate with Human Resources, or Sashi does, um, to just make sure that we are looking for more bilingual um, speaking um, employees or attracting them to the district. But outside that department, I think that last slide is outside that department for um, social workers and counselors. And I do think that if we remember last year when Durham can, the students from Durham can to talk to us, they asked about bilingual counselors. And we made a commitment that one of the criteria for hiring social workers and counselors that we would give preference to Spanish speaking. And I'm wondering if uh, Dr. Pittman um, has anything to add to that. And when you uh, issue the RFPs for the co-located mental health clinics, is in um, Spanish one of the criteria that you are requiring? Which is a critical need. If uh, when Sashi mentioned that in 2014, when we had the influx of the uh, sometimes called border children, otherwise called refugee children, but they were all unaccompanied minors, and they're here with uh, minors, L R S, um, is that that was, um, and we were told from the agencies that are working with them, almost without an exception, every one of those children had been abused in some way. Could I, I think we have some data. In, in the next in the next few slides, I wonder if we should look at that data and then come back is, to you. Is that going to be projected and yeah. discussed? Yeah, I, th I think it relevant to the question you asked, uh, it will not be projected. It will not be projected. Okay, mm -hmm. it's a uh, handout. Mm -hmm. So okay. that's yeah, that's I, I got. And okay. I'll just do a couple quick quick more things, and then I um, first I th thank you guys for bringing this. I, I should have started with that. Um, this is a, a needed conversation, as I think we all know. Um, and I think you've done a very nice job of, of describing what, what the commitment is we make to every ESL student and family, um, irrespective of school. Um, and that's important, right? That's, that's the baseline. Um, I don't think it's, 
for conversation today necessarily, but um, if we can go back to that bar graph slide. Uh, to me, there's a, and maybe this is just for my fellow board members and, and something that I wanna look for in the future. If we could go, yeah, this that, that's fine. Um, there, there's three of them. Um, the number of EL students per school is important for, right, are we providing the services we need to provide? And at the same time, to me, there's also a, a percentage of student population that I'm kind of seeing overlaying this, <laughs> right? Because, you know, 200 plus at Forest View is some percentage of their total population. And so what, what I would like us to have, board members and administration, is a, a conversation about as the percentage of EL learners increases at a school, um, we can't just talk about the promise we make to each student. That start, more and more it starts to talk about what the culture is of the school and what our responsibility is to provide a culture um, for students that may be a tenth, a quarter, a third, or we now have several schools that are over half, um, at least not of English language backgrounds. Um, and so, what is a school that is responsive to those kind of um, cultural needs look like is a, is a more nuanced conversation. Um, it's not as technical. This is a very good technical presentation, um, but that's what, that's what I want us to be able to say to our community, right, to our constituents is um, this is what it looks like. And so I would encourage, uh, I mean, we, we have it in the packet. If you have a packet, you have it, but that's where those data pieces come in for me, and we have, you know, how many adults in the building speak Spanish, but we could also ask that of other languages that may be prevalent. Um, so I... I think you would say this, so I'll, I mean, I, we have a lot of work to do, um, but um, I mean, we always have a lot of work to do, uh, but <laughs> specifically around this, um, yeah. May I add, um, it, it is a technical presentation and, it, and it's a different kind of conversation that needs to occur, but there's also a, a basic question that needs to be asked to this evening. Is it evening? Evening is that, is this, are we covering all the needs? And the answer is no. I mean, let's, the challenges I think are stated in, you know, very nicely, but there is not enough to go around. And, um, and when you look at Forest View, and you all know a little bit about Forest View because the last board meeting you agreed to, um, you know, let them use the activity bus, but behind that, request was 26 brand new refugee children that were from Syria, Syria, Democratic Republic of Congo, Congo Iraq, Iraq, South Africa, and South Africa. I mean, that's, that's huge. And you can see, if you look at the names of the schools, I mean, Forest View, Githens, um, Jordan, they, they happen to be in that part of the county and Riverside is probably the you know the biggest standout you know closer to you know to cent you know to the center part of the city, but boy this is um, I think that there's heroic work going on, but it's it's but it's still at the level of missionary work, you know and it needs to and we need for it to go a different level. I just read a report from um, that was presented to the General Assembly on how um, ELL teachers or ESL teachers are. Um, are allocated, and the, uh, the researcher was presenting it and said, there's no rhyme or reason how they're uh, allocated to different counties. And it was one of the biggest things in the report that you know, they were encouraging the General Assembly to look at this. So I would you know, echo Matt's concerns about, because I wanted to see these all as percentages, because some of our small schools, that's more than half their population. And, and it is a culture thing, but I'd also, encourage us all to note that it's probably two-thirds of our schools that have almost major majority en English learner or, or even Latino students. So it is district-wide almost, other than a, few, a handful of schools. Um, and I appreciate just seeing the progress that you guys have made. Several of these initiatives you've talked about have been within the last year or two. And any progress we, made, we make is, is so... <laughs> critical, um, but when I've met with um, 
state leaders, and, and when I had a chance to speak to the chair of the State Board of Ed, I told him this is the issue that the state is not paying nearly enough attention to, because the funding is in no way adequate. Um, you guys have some idea to, to give us bullet points of how are we getting reimbursed for the state, and what are we, what are we getting, and what do we have beyond what the state supports? I mean. They give us funding for 10.67% of your total school population is what the EL allocation is. So anything above that is locally funded. And, and so we know that it's 30%. And, and, and you don't have to be a math genius, right? You know, 10 from 30. So those are, those are either, either local funds being used, you know, to do this work or the work is not being done. And what it goes down to is also an ESL teacher does, that, that's one piece of the puzzle. But these kids are in other content classes. So it's really about empowering. There are other states that require a certain number of hours of ESL training for every teacher. States like California, even Georgia. So you know it does go into more than the ESL arena. It's about how the whole school is able to embrace the diversity in their schools and be able to help those children progress academically. Part of Monopoly, can I just ask one technical question about ESL itself? Um, so, probably a very complex question to answer, but when when students are 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 pulled out for ESL, are, mm -hmm. is that are they being are those teachers using a curriculum that is? supported, like do they have a district resource that's supporting them, helping them on curricular choices, um, and it, is that, just to answer that question. Right. Yes, so right. our uh, ESL curriculum is actually an alignment to the content standards. Okay. So currently, because of literacy, all our, let me start with high school and middle school. All our ESL teachers are required to be certified, duly certified in English and math and, and uh, ESL. So all our ESL teachers teach what we call sheltered English classes. That means they're their primary English language arts teachers. In that case, they will align to the standards, the North Carolina state standards for English, but they would be differentiating the instruction based on the language proficiency. So a newcomer is addressed in a different way than a student who's been here for seven to 10 years and is still identified as an L. So are you telling me, because I think I know the answer, but I want you to say it out loud, <laughs> so that if, they, if they're a 10th grader and they're studying Shakespeare, because mm -hmm. that's the curriculum, mm -hmm. and, this and, and Shakespeare, for someone who has spoken English for 16 years, can be difficult. Uh -huh. And so that they are required to do Shakespeare. They're required to teach the content standard. So the text can vary. They could use a graphic novel, but they have to teach the standards in English. It's not so much what textbook they're using. So when you use differentiated text, as long as you're, if you're addressing plot and character, that can come from multimedia. And so it is differentiated based on the abilities of the students and to be able to challenge them. So you're not going to always do lower order. You're always aiming for higher order thinking, but with um, scaffolded language, so to speak. So it's differentiated by language, simpler language to address higher order thinking and grade level content. And Sashi, one of the stats that I remember from years ago, and remind me if I'm not right, was that, that you guys typically think of children needing five to seven years of English language instruction just to catch them up to speed on the right. language, right? So that would be five to seven years if the student is at grade level in their native language, five to seven years to master academic language in English. Seven to ten years if they're not, and that means their whole school career, basically. So the challenge is great. And having them do this, held to the same standard, is, it, it seems mm -hmm. like an insurmountable mountain to climb. It is, and they're exempt from their English and reading, EOGs and EOCs, for one year. Year two, they're required to take their EOCs. And for the math and any other content area, they're required to take their EOGs first year. They came in April. 
you put, we put, for um, high school, we placed them strategically, not in their first year for biology class. Oh, but we'll see, we're gonna see that data here just a little bit that includes, that includes that. Yes, that's pretty striking. Uh, a couple uh, other questions from board members? Go ahead now. In teacher turnover, is that an issue with your teachers as well as re recruitment or are we not on wood. wood, holding on to teachers? Uh, we've, we've only lost teachers to uh, retirement and not many and if spouses have moved because the, you know, the spouse has been studying here. But otherwise, I haven't had a high teacher turnover in the last six years. And, um, but you also, we are also doing our own certification process. So that helps us with the pool <coughs> that we do our own ESL certification in Durham Public Schools. Are there any resources within county social services particularly targeted at English learners, other um, agencies that are public that are working with us? I know about the faith community and some of that. But. Right, so we, we actually have been collaborating a little more because of our needs with our two refugee agencies, World Relief and Church World Services. And they've been providing us with a lot of information of um, assistance for non-Spanish, basically, because that's right now our higher need. Um, and so we do have some uh, organizations within, and even DSS, as well as um, El Futuro and Carolina Outreach, for example, just if you look at mental health services and social services, they are required to have an interpreter in those languages for these families. And that was more recent information. In the past, we did not know that. That is information as of two days ago. But on a positive note, to address your question, Mr. Sears, about um, the, the schools. Yes, we're only not even scratching the surface. However, I've visited a couple of principals and uh, at Forest View and Hope Valley. And the one thing that resonates in those schools is to say how, how high it has been an impact in terms of character building for all the rest of their students to be able to work with the diverse group that has come in. And their parents have been all embracing about it as well as the staff. So I'd just like to have a shout out for those schools who've kind of rolled with it. You know, they'd, Hope Valley was one example. They did not know, we didn't know until June that Hope Valley was gonna have a high number of students because of the housing complex with uh, Oak Creek not taking in the refugees, the sh population shifted from Creekside to Hope Valley. And so they just rolled with it and uh, embraced it. So I just wanted to kind of put that out there. Um, I did have just a couple quick things. I, I was at a, guys, following up on what you just said, I was at the Club Boulevard PTA meeting Tuesday night, uh, and you could sense the in the in the building there the the um, sense of community in a in a multicultural setting that was fabulous. That was exactly what you would want, what I would want my children to be part of. Uh, they they identified a couple things that uh, they would like to see us do more of. Uh, one is, and particularly now with the with a lot of unknowns about what the next few months are going to look like, uh, to see if, the, if it's possible for the school system to do uh, trauma identification training, so that teachers and other staff uh, can identify students that are, are in trauma, and then have a mechanism so that it's clear what they're supposed to do in those situations. Uh, that was that was one thing. Uh, and then they, they asked a question about how to, how to create more reading material that reflects the, the lives of, of immigrant families and, and people of color. And I know that's an issue that many of us have talked about. Um, can you speak to that a little bit? So reading material, we, we have got a lot of our, like National Geographic is uh, growing every uh, year with the variety that they offer. I mean, you want to look at something that is not just got pictures of the diversity. It actually has to have content that is more re uh, relatable. And so they've increased in that. And reading A to Z is one of our um, 
online resources, and they have an English learner component, and they've been adding on books as we speak. Like every day I see new books on there. So that's just, it might be the tip of the iceberg, but that's one way, a step toward progress. Okay. I mean, if we could get maybe a, a discussion about how to get trauma training and I some thoughts about that. I'm not expecting so an answer on the spot here, yeah, but. Right. Really, that says it. Yeah. That'd be great. Thanks. Okay. Thank you so much. Uh, you also have in your packets a few handouts with the percentages per school, and Sashi also provided some information on her family engagement, kind of for your references. Everybody see that? Because we don't have those available. Are there questions in that in that section? Or are we? Now you. Okay. See, we're so ready to move on then. No, I was going to do that right after this, and this that that data is related to the presentation we just had, and then I was going to do public comment. Are there any questions on that data? No. Okay. Then I, then I would like to see if anyone has come in who would like to uh, do public comment that, that has come in since the 4.30 start. Yes, please up to the, to the mic, and if you would, uh, is it on? There, okay. and then if you identify yourself. Okay, um, so I am the PTA president at Club Boulevard, and I came just to speak very quickly. Steve was gracious enough to come on Tuesday night, and it was just um, a decision between uh, admin and PTA. It was a, already a night that was set for PTA, and we just felt with recent developments um, that it would not be responsible for us to not acknowledge some of the fear and um, I don't have another word for it in our community right now. Um, and we were very fortunate to have Wilden Acosta come. It was not, I did not know he was coming. And Steve started us off and then graciously handed over to him. And so um, also something that was shared by our community is that I think parents in the community wanna know that our schools are safe, even if it's some kind of symbol that we put on the door or that we um, share out to the community Durham's policy with, uh, in, in regards to immigration, especially, and that at the time we do not work with um, ICE and that immigration status is not shared. Um, I know that there was a, a lot of parents who were just very pleased when Dr. Loam sent that message out shortly after the election, and I think that was actually what kind of started that conversation, which is that Durham Public Schools need to remain respectful and inclusive and hearing I did not know about the um, refugee uh, students club has not been affected in that way. I think Central American families, but certainly not from Iraq or Syria. And just getting that out to other people and reminding everyone is something that I know um, our community really needs. And I will say that that night made me very, very proud to be a club parent. And, um, you know, we choose to have our kids here. We choose to be in Durham Public Schools. Um, so that's pretty much why I came out. Thank you. And, and I, I believe just before you get that, I believe that you're going to send something out to other schools about what you're yeah, doing. Yeah, we're so. actually already in talks with EKPO and Forest View. Um, parents have already reached out. So, um, and, I, and I think that that's great that it's actually coming from Facebook is a great tool. So certain people saw things and it's already gotten out. And there's a, um, just from two days, there's already seems to be a pretty big need. Uh, so that's what we're starting to do is create a toolkit of what we did and how we got parents involved. So, did, did we get your name? I'm sorry if I missed it. Yeah. Uh, uh, Javiera, Javiera, Caballero. Caballero. Thank you. Thank you very much. Hey, uh, yeah, Brian Profit. I'm the president of the Durham Association of Educators. And uh, first, just want to reiterate how amazing this program was at Club the other night. I've been involved in DPS now for 
11, uh, 10 years, and I've never participated in anything that, that was as moving as, as that was on school grounds. Um, and so I'm super excited about uh, continuing to engage with the Parents at Club and help this happen in a number of other places. Um, secondly, I want to reiterate, and I said this to you earlier on today, Dr. Lum, but I want to say it publicly as well, um, all of the, the words that came and the sentiment that came on the backside of the election just felt really un felt really important in ways that, you know, we all say, oh, this is just the right thing to do, but lots of people aren't doing it. Lots of people aren't stepping up. Lots of people aren't saying those things publicly. And so I think to have that be the center of the discussion and anyone who has a position that is outside of that, right, automatically now has to relate to the center, which is doing the right thing. Um, so I think that that's in, in profoundly important. There was one piece that I wanted to add to the discussion uh, because uh, the, the, on the priority list, uh, the point about bilingual social workers and counseling staff was noted as a priority. Um, and then Matt, you asked the question about the percentages of, of staff that are bilingual in general, and in particular Spanish speakers, since that's the highest population. I think there's a, there's a, there's a small stat that's hidden in there and a reality that's hidden in there that I think that everyone should know, which is that when you have bilingual staff, Spanish speaking staff in a building, but they're not dedicated to this work, what I'm seeing all over the district, and I'm not just raising this as a question of kind of workers' rights, but also for the provision of services for students and for families, those staff are, are taxed fairly constantly during planning periods, before school, after, after school, sometimes pulled out of class, right, uh, without, without compensation and without consideration for the ways in which losing either that planning time, that before school time, that after school time, or that class time will impact their students. And so these, are, these decisions are being left to individual principals, and I think some of them are handling it more responsibly, and some of them are handling it less responsibly. responsibly. Given the resources, I know it's a, it's a difficult situation, but I, but I also wanna make sure that the board and the senior staff is aware of that problem, right? Because just having a, a, a percentage of bilingual staff and Spanish speaking staff actually doesn't, doesn't handle the trick. What it, what it means is that those folks are really overworked and that their students suffer because of it. So I just, I wanna make sure that that's inserted into the conversation as well. If we don't have dedicated bilingual staff, if we don't have dedicated Spanish speaking staff, anyone who speaks Spanish is gonna get pulled in these ways that's happening right now. So, thanks. Sorry, could you just, could you say your name into the microphone? Oh, I, I did in the beginning, oh, but I'll do it again. Yeah, I'm, so I'm Brian Prophet. Thank you. Just making sure I know who you are. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, as we transition to our next presentation, we have done uh, a data dig at the elementary level and middle school level. High school will be slightly different because we don't have as many formative assessments like we do at the elementary level and middle school levels but Dr. Spencer and her team have tried to provide a more in-depth analysis of our EOC data, graduation data, and all things related to high school data that's really more tied to the accountability model than formative assessments. But she will walk us through um, many pieces of that information as it provides insight into the work in our high schools. Sounds good. So as we think about our high schools, um, and kind of our data points, I would definitely agree with Dr. Wilson-Norman, most of our data points at the high school level are a much more summative type data point. So um, some of this data you've seen um, as we did our kind of data release in September, but it gives us a chance to dig into it, looking at um, groups of students um, as well as schools. And um, also thinking about our SAT, ACT, AP, um, oftentimes you, you get pieces of AP, you get pieces of SAT, so kind of looking at that together. And then I will say the part that I'm most excited about um, to be able to share, we have um, been working with Durham Children's Data Center and I have um, Beth Gifford who is with us today um, to, to begin one of our three kind of big projects with Durham Children's Data Center, one centers around graduation. And so we have done some pretty extensive work to look into our graduation data, look at our students who are dropping out, looking at who they are, looking at predictive, um, com you know, predictive indicators, looking at um, ways that we can begin transferring that data right to the schools to begin intervention in the right places. So um, 
I, I, we have a very, very um, meaty um, data presentation for you. So with me also, so Beth Gifford is here with Durham Children's Data Center. Also with us is Karen Beckett, um, coordinator for data and accountability as well. So she was key in putting together all of our data, much of which you've seen, but I think kind of just in thinking about, so we're just going to focus on this 912 piece today and thinking how um, our students are doing at the high school level. Manager. Durham uh, Children's Data Center, those of you who are on the board before last, you know, before the recent election, that was, this is the fruits of that work in developing those relationships with Duke, with Ken Dodge's organization called Family and Child. Center for Child and Family Policy. Center for Child and Family Policy at the Sanford School at Duke University. Did I get it right? Did I get that part right? Thank you. And I wanted to make sure that you all heard that. Mm -hmm. So, the first um, data set that we're going to look at is our end of course test results. And I'm going to go pretty quickly through this section because I think that you've seen it. Um, you you have studied this um, for quite some time now and just kind of making sure that we put it in front of you again when we think about how are our students doing. Um, as we think about English 2, Math 1, and Biology um, end of course test. And when we think about these, they are, we want all of our students to have math one and English two by the 10th grade and biology by the 11th grade. And those are requirements set um, before us. When we think about math one, over the three year period, we have um, slight but still an increase. When we think of biology, we have a nice um, substantial increase. And English two is the one that has um, kind of stumbled along, and I know that our academics team is looking at more closely. Can when I ask a question about that previous slide? Sure. That 2013 2014 numbers, like, is are they exact? That the grade level proficiency in the college and career ready, like, the numbers are the same for 2013 2014? 4.8 twice. Isn't that the right. year that they changed I, the? Mm, we will double check that. Friends already figured that one out. I can't read it. I don't have my glasses. So the correct figures for college and career ready for English 2 is 44.2. For math 1, it's 35.7. And for biology, it's 34.6. Oh, I see what you're saying now. Sorry. The challenge with data presentations is everything is manually done, <laughs> it's repeating numbers. So oh. when we think about our college career indicators, did you have another, did you have a question? Uh, yeah, I'm sorry. Um, you, you pointed out in math, you said there was a substantial increase. In Biology. Math. Biology is the one with, I would call more substantial. Math one is more slight. So. Okay, so it still is an based increase. on the so so for CCR the forty nine at for twenty fourteen. So oh, were you talking about an increase from 2014, 2015? Mm -hmm. yes. Okay, okay. I see, right. I see where you're saying. Okay, now. okay. Mm -hmm. I was looking all the way across there. Okay. Got it. So when we think of college and career readiness indicators four-year cohort graduation rate, which we're going to talk about um, in much more detail, um, has been an increase. When we think about ACT, I think one of our po very positive data points for 15-16 was um, with our ACT. When we look at ACT work keys and math course rigor, both having, um, if you look at the three-year period, slight decreases. I think one of the pieces to to think about, especially with ACT work keys, is the flip of that is it's a very challenging group um, to make sure that we have our 95% tested because it's not clear. It, those are students who, once they walk across the stage at graduation, they are a completer. And um, it is as simple as if they change their schedule the last semester, all of a sudden they could become a completer and perhaps they 
um, were off the radar to be tested. It is not the same as English 2, where we have a class roster and we know who we're testing. Um, we have to um, derive the list with all the data. And so one of the things that has happened with work keys is that we have increased our participation um, over the course of years because we've struggled in this area. So when we think of EOC test proficiency, this is, would be a combination of all EOCs. So if you look at Math 1, English 2, and Biology combined um, as a composite, this kind of gives you an overall picture of our schools, as well as, of course, Durham Public Schools on the front end. So I would also add that this is our um, college and career ready proficiency. Um, when we think about our schools, the schools that um, over the course of years had proficiency rates higher than the district, um, we see Jordan, we see CMA, DSA, early college, middle college. When we look at um, schools who have seen an increase in their overall proficiency, um, DSA, Hillside, early college, middle college, northern and riverside. So over the course of um, three years. When we break it down um, with biology, I would just say this is a, a very positive place um, of of improvement that's pretty notable um, and most of our high schools um, have seen increases it's, you know especially point out hillside early college and middle college um, with scores that have exceeded um, previous years when we look at English too as mentioned this is an area that I know that has been a focus area for us as we've started this school year um, thinking about schools that did have um, proficiency rates higher than our district, Jordan, CMA, DSA, early college, um, and in particular early college with a, um, early college just keeps bringing it. I just, I don't have a different way to say it. They, they just continue to find um, improvement, places of improvement. Math one. Um, when we think about math one schools higher than the district average, CMA, DSA, early college, school for creative studies. When we think about schools that um, had increases, we think about Jordan, City of Medicine had a nice increase, DSA increase, early college once again a 13.3 increase, Northern Riverside creative studies with a, um, you know, so, so there's some bright spots with increases in proficiency. When we continue to break down EOCs and look at subgroup performance, and I'm, I, I was trying to think of a good way to do this because you have it in front of you. I don't know that um, reading it to you is going to be very helpful except to say that it follows, the, it definitely follows the patterns that we've seen um, certainly in our conversation of um, although the state does not provide this specifically um, race and gender, we recently um, provided that to you. And certainly we know that we have significant um, gaps in both our black students and Hispanic students. So, so it's kind of, of course, English too, you're gonna see some declines. Biology, you're gonna see some increases, follows suit of the whole school and then math one. So when we look at EOC test with um, groups of students with exceptionalities, including academically intellectually gifted, um, limited English proficiency and students with disabilities, um, when you look at it from the angle of 2015 to 2016, uh, you know, I will say there, there was an increase um, slight increase in all three of those areas. Um, overall, over the course of three years, it still is in a pretty similar place. If you look at it from the district angle, I think um, 2015 we took a little dip, but then, and that's kind of across the board in our high school data, or 2015 kind of took a little dip and then we um, rebounded um, some in 2016. So looking at our 
SAT, well, let me just stay here for a second. SAT, ACT, and AP. So just um, when we think about these data points, the ACT is the only one of these that really is a part of the state accountability model. Um, all 11th graders take that and are required, and we're required to have 95 participation, not only in whole school, but also in all of our subgroups. When we look at SAT, SAT is, a, is student initiated um, and funded, and obviously it um, is a subset of students. Although it still is a pretty large and it's comparable to the state percentage of um, test takers. And then AP is the same and, and certainly there's special um, provisions in terms of funding test and I think Durham does an outstanding job of ensuring that um, students are able to, to get in the class even if funding the test is an issue. So when we look at the district SAT, ACT, and AP, when we look at the um, SAT results, you'll, there's a subsequent slide with um, school details, but you can see number of test takers, composite mean, and the composite is um, made up of the reading, the math, and the writing, and then kind of a similar process for ACT. And we sit right below, the, but right at the state average for both of those. AP, we sit above the state average. Can you explain that ACT writing score jump? Is, mm -hmm. Did they redo something in the material? Yes, they, they um, reset the scale and the benchmark. And um, it, it actually still shows, and when I get to a later slide that is focused just on writing, I can give you a little more information. But, but the piece of it that's interesting is that there still was a jump. Um, but when I looked at that, um, I immediately realized that and remembered that the state had reset the scale. And on that slide, I've kind of referenced the scale, the change. So when we think about SAT results by school, the um, I would say it's a pretty steady, um, steady in but slight increase. When we think about the composite, I did want to point out the composite for 2014-15 because I um, was noticing the, the jump and realized that the state actually provides two composites, one that's the reading and math and then one reading, math, and writing. And the composite in 2014-15 was reading and math. So we will need to um, update this and get this to you so you can see the full comparison. But, it, but it, even then, um, our schools had a slight um, increase. I will also point out that the SAT results are only up through students who took it in January. Um, a new test came out in March and will be reported on for the first time in 2017. And we have been kind of informed that it will be very difficult to compare a 2017 with a 2016. So kind of thinking about this is, this is, mm -hmm. and this is the old test. There are no new test data included in this. I have a question um, on that. This is kind of digging in. You, you may not have an answer for this, but you mentioned earlier that the SAT um, is, is by choice of the student, of the parent. And so and I think many of the colleges are looking at it less and more toward the ACT. And the trend is for most of these schools to have less people taking the test. But there's two schools where it jumped. Middle college jumped. Uh, from 30 to 33 to 51, and then Southern jumped from 97 to 83 to 122. Do you know any, any reason why that might? It just seems so interesting. I don't, but I, one of the things, I'm actually going to give you one other data set that actually gives you, I think it's helpful, it gives you the percentage tested. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So so when we think about the um, actual percentage tested, I think it's interesting. We, we surpassed the national average. Um, so we test 54.5%. In 2016, we tested 54.5% of our students, um, whereas nationally it's at 45.8%. Um, however, 
in the state of North Carolina, 58.2 tested. So we're slightly below the state um, rate of testing. Do you also have percentage numbers on the based on the school as well? So like we have the number of students tested yes. out of who's eligible? Which is why I think this might be, okay. if, if you're interested in looking at the participation, I think that this would be a helpful document I can get to you. Thank you. All right, I'm gonna switch gears a little bit to ACT. And this gives you, once again, this gives you your, um, oftentimes when we have come to, to present and share data at the board, we often share the percentage of students that are, percent, or that are proficient. And proficiency for ACT is at a, at a score of 17, which is the minimum requirement for um, North Carolina uh, universities. And so, public universities. And so what is different about this data point would be looking at it from the angle of the composite mean. Um, and so you can see, for example, the increase of the mean for Durham Public Schools. I think when you, every, it, as I've looked at our ACT data, really in every way, we, we definitely had a noteworthy increase from 15 to 16, and I'm sure Dr. Wilson Norman can probably point her finger on exactly where um, that happened. I always tell Dr. Lum when, when, when you're strategic, you can know where your bump is and you can normally explain it. And I would say with ACT, there is something that, that very specific happened to be able to, um, to get the increase that we did within our ACT results. So, Do you remember if we had mm -hmm. snow makeup rescheduling's of any of these takings? These are during the school no. day, right? These we made it this past year. Yep. Um, I do believe it was questionable. It, I think it was toward, it was a day or two after a snow delay, but it was a clear. It was there was not a oh my goodness are we going to have school or not kind of day. Um, I think lots of prayer <laughs> helped us take this. If for those of you who may remember, I think it was two years ago, it was pretty horrific, and I think by the time our students really took the ACT, it was March or April. Um, the ACT test is, is and ACT work keys um, is a very different type of test for us to administer because we are very bound by the, sta by the standardization from ACT versus DPI. Um, so even um, dealing with irregularities, we have to wait to hear from ACT when to retest or if we can retest or if it's a snow day, how that how we can um, manage that. Even our schools that start at nine o'clock or after previous years, we have to request a waiver to be able to test after nine o'clock. So this year we have a waiver for all of our high schools to do such. So um, it's a little different when we deal with ACT. Can so I, can I ask another question about the sure. ACT? And mm -hmm. I maybe should know this, who takes, every, I know everyone is, takes an in DPS, mm -hmm. but like who, what grade level takes it? Is it required? Like we make sure every single student yes. takes it? That That's a great question. So all 11th graders are required to take it and that is set by the state. Mm -hmm. um, and so actually it comes out of state, it comes out of general statute that our um, 11th graders take um, a college achievement test and then our 10th graders take a, a pre-test and actually general statute requires that eighth graders take a test. However, the state has had challenges um, with ACT's version of the middle school test. So right now we give it, we give um, pre-ACT, it's now called pre-ACT, it used to be called plan. We give that to our 10th graders and then 11th graders take the ACT, which is an achievement test. So when we're looking at these numbers here, that's every single 11th grader? Every single schools. 11th grader, we're bound to the 95% participation 95%. rate. So okay. schools that don't meet the 95% have to, you know, take precautions um, in planning for the, pre for the subsequent year. Uh, I would also say that um, our school, our high schools d have definitely expressed challenges um, and because we are bound by ACT, it is a one day test and the, and the state tells us the day and if it's a snow day or if it's, you know, if there's been um, some kind of community or school crisis, then it, it still carries on. Um, there is a one day makeup and so 
you know, our schools have to work really hard to identify those students who missed it and get them there on that particular day as well. And, and, and so there's two days, the day and the makeup, and it's set by the state. Um, and it's, and it's a, it is a great challenge for all of our school districts. Um, I, would, I would say that that's uniform across the state. So when we look at um, our ACT English results, you can see varies from school to school with jumps. Um, then we have the reading composite. But it is, I think it's interesting looking at it by school and looking at the connection um, to ESCs as well as other data points. I'm not going to read this to you. Math. Um, and writing. And note in the top right-hand corner the scale change. So it used to be a 1 to 12 scale, and now it's a 1 to 36 scale with the benchmark, so in each of these areas, the state sets a benchmark and schools get a report as to which students meet the benchmark, obviously moving towards the 17 for a composite. I will say, I think, I'll, I think if you look across the board at our um, high school data, I would say that writing is definitely a, an area of need. They didn't give you any way to compare and say, you know, if you were this many points above last year that you could say that was positive. Well, to translate from the 36 scale back oh, down to the... Right, no. there's they, no conversion. Th there's no conversion score. A and I thought about just doing a different slide because it it's a little awkward and just decided that I would put the scale change, point it out. Um, I think you can still see the patterns. I like Ms. Dunra's interpretation better. <laughs> <laughs> then science, um, which I think does reflect what is what we see with happening in our EOC scores um, in science. So I think that's a positive for our district. And um, Beth Cross, of course, our champion for advanced placement classes, gives um, ha has spoken to our AP um, tests and results and of course works hand in hand with our schools regarding our results. Um, I would say the one um, thing I would point out is that the test taken is, is possibly duplicated in terms of students. So a student may take more than one test. And so um, it is not number of students, it is number of tests for us. And, and so explain this, it says it has three years up there, but there's one number. Um, so it's a combination, and Karen, you may speak a little more to that data set. It's, this comes from a report that we received from the state that provides, provides it in multi-year. We have it individual years, too. So, so help me understand what, what the 401. This is actually back. one year of data. We need to go back oh. and provide the other two. And, and do you know what year that is? Um, I believe it's 2016. I, mean, I, I can s say for myself, one, one because I, I was looking at the earlier slide and it showed a substantial increase in the number of students taking AP tests. Um, and I know for myself, I always worry about putting the percent of students sc scoring a three. Uh, what I'm personally interested in is, is the number of students scoring a three or higher. But I think when we put the percent up, what, what happens at, this, at the school level is that teachers feel like they're being evaluated on the percent of students that score a three. And so then there's an incentive to push kids out of the class so that your percentage goes up. And I think the data is clear that, that taking the class is good, what, whatever the outcome. And so to me, if the measurement is the number of students that that score three rather than the percentage, then we're going to encourage uh, schools to place students in those classes. We're going to encourage teachers to welcome the kids into the class. Uh, it, I think it sends a different message. Um, but but, say, but let's let's underline that, okay? Because there's no downside for taking an AP class, because right. they're going to be better prepared to take the SAT, better prepared to take the ACT, better prepared when they get to college, regardless of the score. So the number, the number of kids taken 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. If that's what we want. So we just can't leave this slide without continuing to to bring up that issue of equity and making sure that we have course offerings um, at every school. Uh, and I know you guys, you know, Advanced Academics has done so much work with the AP summer camps and everything, but you know, there should be more test takers at Hillside and Southern, um, I think. So just as we continue to. Well, Hillside would be, students would be taking the IB test too, wouldn't they? Could be. Mm -hmm. We don't, we don't have those numbers. We can get those numbers, but not in this presentation. Right. Mm -hmm. right. I, I'm just having a, all this data. I've, I'm, I'm wanting to have a special response unit go over to Southern. I'm just, you know, so that's my takeaway on, on it, and I just needed one place to put it in here, so. All right. We're going to switch gears a little and think about... I, I, when I think about graduation, one of the things I try to remind folks that it's it's really not a high school indicator, even though they, they get the brunt and, and we call it on them, it is a K-12. We know that it does not happen just in high school. It's It really happens well before they get to high school. Um, I think that the, I'll call it research, study that we've done certainly indicates um, that. And there are lots of nuances and challenges to kind of what I'll call the data collection process for graduation. Um, our schools spend a lot of time even just thinking about record keeping um, as it relates to graduation. Really, quite frankly, more than they should have to think about it, but it is part of making sure that the number is truly reflective of um, of the student's status versus just the school's ability to track down where the student went to. Um, we have we met yesterday with our high school's um, graduation teams and thinking about um, preparing for our um, cohort graduation rate at the end of the year, not only from the standpoint of the data collection, but also of um, knowing who your students are, knowing how to intervene, setting up processes to intervene. Um, and so our graduation work, um, really, this is a piece of it, which is to make sure that we are operating and thinking about it from the angle of where are our um, places of high need. So I'm actually going to um, share with you a little bit about the initial project, and then I'm going to pass the mic over, so to speak, to Beth um, Gifford to kind of walk us through some of the findings. Um, but this is a this particular graduation study is looking at our I'll call it the students who would were to graduate in 2015. So it's the 2014-15. This is a year off. We're at the end stages of 15-16 um, data, and we'll also do a kind of an analysis to see are they comparable um, from year to year. Um, there, is, there are slight differences in the data from even the DPI report, so you may see slight number differences, and that's because they're working with a raw data set, um, in particular with some duplicate students, so student IDs. Um, and so it's very slight, but wanted to point that out because um, you'll, you'll see a few cha challenges with it. And when we think about graduation, um, one of the the things to remind folks, it's not how many um, seniors graduate, it's how many of your um, four years ago, 20 day roster, how many of those are graduates. Um, so I think that that's one thing that we have to keep reminding folks. Um, and so when they get the list, they are looking at a list of students that may have been not with them for one, two, three years, four years, even some. So we're going to look at it from the angle of our graduates and what does our data say about who our graduates are, but we're also going to look at it for who are the non-graduates um, in thinking about a group of those are students who we know dropped out, and then some of them are classified as kind of unknowns, um, and it really has to do with how they were coded um, in the ultimate authoritative data source, which was PowerSchool or um, I think for some of these students it would have crossed into NCYs. So I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Gifford. 
I just want to make sure this works. All right, thanks for having me. So, so we're gonna look at a series of slides that describe the cohort that um, Julie just discussed. And so you can see, so this is the group of students who started out as ninth graders and or who are part of this transfer group, who transferred in, who are part of the denominator for the 2014-15 school year. And so of that group, sort of a familiar number is just a little over 80% were graduates. Um, but what becomes interesting is then to think about who are these non-graduates. And so 19% of our sample, almost 20% of our sample is considered not graduates. But actually about 7% of them are, are still in school in the 2014-15 school year. So, so they're not sort of the dropouts that we, th that we think of them. They're, they're still participating in the school system. Um, these 40 students are the ones that Julie was talking about where it, it comes down to trying to make sure that we're actually ac accurately documenting what happened to them. Um, and about 11% were, had dropped out of school um, by 14, 15, so by the year they would have been a senior. Um, and so I wanna just describe what these series of slides show. So these are just the total numbers of students in, who are in the cohort. Um, this group is going to be those who graduated and this is those who didn't graduate. So this subtotal is all of those who are the non-graduates and then broken down by dropped out, still in school or other. And then these are all row percentages. So here, these are the, gonna be the percentage of males and these are gonna be the percentage of females who either graduated, dropped out or didn't drop out. Um, and so some of the things that we can see are, are, are things that we, that we know, that there's a gap between males and females in the graduation rate, and there's our, our well-known um, racial and ethnic um, gap in graduation rates. And the points I wanted to point out here, though, is that the EC students, only about 60% of those actually graduated on time. Um, among our LEP, it was closer to half, just over half. Um, and students who are over age, in ninth grade, so they were, they were over age already starting in ninth grade, um, which is about 500 students, 58% um, of those graduated on time. I'm gonna skip this slide, because we have it, and I'm gonna talk about it in the future. Um, one of the goals of this project was to start to identify early warning signs um, that we could act on in, you know, in the future so we don't have to wait until they're in 11th or 12th grade. Um, and so this is looking at their absenteeism and school suspensions in the ninth grade. And so students who missed zero to three days, 94% graduated on time. Four to six days, is still doing great, 91%. Um, seven to nine, getting closer to the state average, or to the DPS average of 80, 82.6. But students who missed 10 or more days, which was 650 of our ninth graders, um, you're, the percentage that graduated are, are down to 54%. Um, so so it's, it's a measure that we can identify. Can I point out one thing on this slide, which is this was during their ninth grade year. So this cohort, this particular slide reflects data for ninth graders. And um, I think it comes up later on in one of our highlights is the relationship of, of attendance was is pretty a strong relationship at ninth grade, a little less at tenth grade, and not much of a relationship. It seemed that students, regardless of the number of absences at eleventh, twelfth, it, it didn't show up to be as strong of an indicator. So that's why we pulled out the ninth grade because that's where the relationship is. And before you go to the suspension, are those double counted? Would absences also, you know, or are they separate coding? Um, they're separate, so zero to three, four to six. You're, you're in one of those categories. Each student missed. Yeah, but are you absent because you're suspended? Could like, be. Are, oh, that's yeah. what you mean. Okay. Yeah. Sorry, I misunderstood the question. There, there could be a relationship between the two as it relates to suspensions, yes. And, and so, but then with also with suspension, so students who were suspended zero days, close to 87% graduated on time, and then in any of our suspension categories, it, the graduation rate drops quite drastically. So one to 10 days, only 53% of the students graduated on time. And students with long-term suspensions, um, 11 to 20 days, 35% graduated on time, and, and 21 or more days, it's down to 6%.
Um, so we, we mentioned in the first slide that the students with um, exceptionality, exceptional disabilities were um, less likely to graduate on time, but is the point of this slide was just to show that it's not um, universal across all the disabilities, that, that, that there's variation. Um, and so one of the, the larger groups of disabilities is um, specific learning disabilities and um, 100, with 119 students there. And that group, it was down to about 66% graduated on time. Um, Yeah, the, the, what stands out to me on this particular slide for disability status is um, I, I kind of zoomed in on where the dropouts were and and it doesn't always go, um, I think, with how people think it's going to be. And so even from an educator standpoint. Um, so to me, I was kind of surprised to see that on the flip with 65% learning disability student, 65% graduated, on the flip of that, 24% for students with dis learning disability didn't, were dropped out. Um, the other one, other health impaired, um, almost 26% speech language um, kind of stood out to me. So I, it was not the, uh, to me, the ones that we know, for example, intellectual disability, um, severe, we know those students um, have challenges. Now, they, they don't necessarily graduate with a diploma, but they're not in the kind of dropout um, group. And so I think, to me, this slide illustrates, I, can't, I think it combats some of the myths that folks think that may be out there in terms of students with disabilities. But I would go back to the relationship to the very first slide, which is when we look at graduation rates, the two groups that stand out um, would be your limited English proficiency students and your students with disabilities. Those are the two groups that actually stand out the most in terms of being um, off sync with not only our district average, but your state and just what you know we need our students to be at. Is it out of sync with um, um, students with disabilities for the state? I knew you were going to ask that and I and I looked at it early and it's and it's we are a little below the state average in in both of those areas limited English proficiency and students but this is an it but it's a, this is not an excuse but it is an issue almost in every district it is it is mm -hmm. what stands out to me is the non EC learners we have 344 that didn't Ninety-nine dropped out. We'll have one hundred and twelve of them in school. But from each of these, if we if we go back at each of these slides, we see where race, class, and disability cross. I mean, all all of that's the same. You know, black children are the higher suspended, most the dropout, uh, the low. So, I mean, and, and, and we go back to the academic. It's, it's all the same thing. And so the the it's not a red flag. It's like a bomb. You know. And it's not something that we haven't known, but now we see, we've known it anecdotally, but now we see the um, the data that really just that that just proves it, that shows it. So we we're in the solution mode now. On on the EC students, so this way, so <coughs> if you're a student that stays in school till 21, which is true for a number of of our EC students. On this slide, you would show up in the still in school. That's right. And so, so, so eventually those kids graduate or what, it, some equivalent, or they just age out. They don't ever get a diploma, or, so there's no graduation. And so they're considered, so even if you are severely intellectually disabled, you're considered a non-graduate by the state standards. And I think you have a great point, which is when we look at the columns with did not graduate, even if it's still in school, even if it's other, at the end of the day, they're counting as not graduates. Um, even challenges like a student going to get a GED, although it may be better than nothing, it is still not qualifying as a graduate. So um, even there are other programs for students 
um, many that we support in our community for disconnected youth, but at the end of the day, they when they finish, they are not finishing with a diploma which puts them in the category of graduate. And I think, um, I also think about our students with, with the most severe disability who are on um, an alternative curriculum, alternative assessments, then at the end of the day get a certificate and not a diploma, they too do not, they count against the school's graduation rate. So I think, you know, even having the conversations of when we make those decisions that, for example, at the high school level, a student can no longer finish with the occupational course of study, at the end of the day, we're moving them to a non-diploma um, pathway. And a non-graduate. And a non-graduate. But if There's a whole other set of research about what, you know, the, the life story and the research for students that are non-graduates. Can you go back two slides, the one that says graduates and non-graduates, demographic characteristics, wherever, maybe it was just one slide, I don't know. Yeah. There's that. So that one I actually see that in Durham, black students are actually doing well. So I got that 79.7%. It's, it's just below our district average. We want it to be 100%, don't get me wrong. But where I see the weakness is the LEP students at 52% and the EC at 59. I mean, that, that's why you're bringing that laser focus to that issue, right? So, I mean, if we want to be truth tellers to our community, we've got work to do. Right. But black students in Durham are doing well, un unless I'm, I mean. <laughs> well, 79% of them are, 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 are doing well. They graduate, have graduated. I'm not. And I'm not trying to argue with you, Minnie. Mm, no, I just don't. it we the <laughs> there's a gap <laughs> that right. we that we need to continue to to tackle, but black students are doing well in Durham um, and can do better. I mean, but the the profound gap is down there with EC and LEP students. I mean, right. And and in the highlights, um, the highlights page, we actually even though this does not the tables do not pull out race and um, gender, we do highlight black males and Hispanic males because if you break it down, it is, it, that is where um, there is a gap. But if you look at it from the categories that the state gives, um, for example, at the state during this particular year, the state average for black students' graduation was 82%. Hispanic 79.9 um, but and then of course when you go down to EC and LEP um, EC students the state was 67 and the LEP was 57.5 and so the, there's a gap at the state level and it's even um, a little larger with our students. And you look at that over age in the ninth grade, 198. And the over can age you, in the ninth yeah. grade. Can you go back to five? Oh no, I think it's only a different. 514. So 514. And this particular slide <laughs> could reflect <laughs> students who come in kindergarten through eighth grade retentions. Um, there's another slide that's going to show it the students that are actually retained in ninth grade. Could these be overlap with what um, Sashi and was talking about with um, with uh, students who come first time into a high school? You don't know where they are. They don't speak English. They're in the ninth grade. They're over age. Absolutely. <laughs> I w I having just met with our large comprehensive high school graduation teams. I think our number one takeaway was kind of thinking about um, that group of students, not only from a data collection standpoint, which there's challenges in kind of distinguishing credits that they come in and translating um, transcripts from other countries and such. There's that piece of it from a data collection standpoint. Also the data collection of when they leave us, certain documentation is required for us to actually say that they should be removed from what I'll call the denominator um, from the cohort list. So there's a data collection challenge. And then of course there's also the real challenge of 
can they do make it through high school, achieving all the credits, four years at the same rate that every stu other student um, does. So that both are real challenges for schools. Okay, so then what we started to do was try to look at some of the, the course taking characteristics in ninth grade. And so the one we're gonna talk about tonight was, was math one and it turns out to be a relatively good predictor. So math one's typically taken in ninth grade. Um, students who score a one on math one, only half of those graduated on time, versus students who are scoring threes and fours is over 90%. So students who are scoring a two is about two thirds. Students who score a one, one half graduate on time. And so students who score a three or a four have a, have a much higher probability of graduating. Um, quick question first. This is for every ninth grader who took math one in ninth grade. So if you took math no, one. No, you didn't have to take it in ninth grade. Okay, it's so actually anyone. the first time that you took math one, regardless of when you took it. Thank you. And this actually, you'll notice, has just level one, two, three, four. So this predates the new curriculum, the new test that was implemented in, tw in 12, 13. So there's also a different um, change for many of these students. Scores were higher on the previous scale. Yes. Mm -hmm. And some students, it would have been a, you know, we would have done a conversion if, if need be, but. but. I would suspect though, it, it's still a good s sorter. <laughs> yeah, okay. So this, so one of the things that we were interested in is understanding scheduling of classes and, and when when students are taking classes and, and how's that impacting um, their ability to graduate. And so it's not surprising that students who take, who take math one before ninth grade, they're, they're sort of your high achievers. And so they're, they tend to be above 90%. Um, I know Dr. Spencer finds it fascinating the students who are, who are promoted to, t to take this test early who still don't graduate. So it's not, it's not a given. dropouts that took it in middle school. I think that's a myth, you know. I think it's something to look at. Um, so, so it's relatively normative to take it in ninth grade, and that about eighty percent graduate on time. Um, the students who took it in tenth grade actually only half of them graduated on time. Um, relatively few students took it in eleventh and twelfth grade, and those are probably the students who are really motivated now to graduate and who are taking their their classes that, that they're behind in. But the students who took it in 10th grade um, were at risk for dropping out, or for, well, for dropping out and not graduating. Can, can you help me understand, what what is a, so N here is close to 2,500, right? Yes. At, at what point, so like you're talking about the 10th graders, there's 70 took it. You know, no, that, 138 that, took it in 10th grade. I'm sorry, I was looking at the wrong column. Okay, but what is the number where we, we start to say that, that that means something versus that's just too small. Like is it 20, is it 40? So I think it really depends when on is the folks who are running the programs and who are. So, so like we, we can get down in the weeds on any one of these boxes, but when you're talking about 10 kids compared to 2,500, where, where's the point where, uh, just so I can understand the table better. I, th I think the main point was though that that there has that that we were working on whether or not scheduling was working out right, and so some students were taking it in 10th grade, and it, sure. it might even be whether like is does this get expanded or not expanded, and how does yeah. that put them at I, risk? So I'm, I'm not being clear. I'm sorry. Um, no, I, I understand. So, so there there's two reasons though why a number would matter, right? One is because it's currently um, is it big or small, but it also could be growing or shrinking, right? And, and you could change which trend you have. Okay. I mean, is that? Yeah. So I think I'm asking across the different slides, not just on this. Oh, sure. Like what what is a statistically significant number? So when, it's when the sample size is 2,500. Right. So. You have a population of data, so you actually don't need to have standard errors, right? Because you have the number, hmm. so they are different. 
So 13 is different than 14 when you have the entire population. So I think what's more important than thinking about whether or not it's statistically significantly different is whether or not the magnitude is important enough to make a difference to change programming. And that's, I think, more of a decision that we have to decide. Um, okay, I think that might be what I'm looking for. And do you have a guess right. at that or a thought on that? <coughs> I think it depends on the answer and how much of a difference it makes, right? Okay. I mean, because that, that's, I mean, in terms of if we were doing a cost-benefit analysis, it would matter if we were talking about some, a program that costs $2 versus a program that costs $20,000 per student. But these are all students, so you want to know if you, yeah, you had a handful take it in seventh grade and what happened to them. So that doesn't bother me. No, it doesn't what bother me. You? I mean, I'm yeah, not trying every, to every single box is a conversation. I, I, I get that. I'm just trying to... Yeah, and I'm not trying to argue wanted. with you. I'm just trying to think through what, when we would make a difference. Okay. But, but making a decision with three in a box rather than 300 in a box, I, I, you know, 50% of 300 is, boy, there's 150 kids. Yeah. But three in the box, and then there's three in the box next year, and they all pass next year, and they all didn't pass this year. It's hard to make a decision based on that. Well, my recommendation would not be that students take math one in 12th grade. <laughs> but would you recommend? That's hundred percent. But are we? Not my point. <laughs> are we? Are we taking away that ninth grade is the best time? Or before? Or before? Mm -hmm. Well, okay. I'm assuming that the six, seven, eight graders that are taking this it selection effect. are kind of the accelerated kids. The kids who are already moving. Is that a good? That's that's a good assumption. assumption? Okay. So I'm not even looking at that. I'm looking at the high school mm -hmm. situation because that's a matter of scheduling. It is. And and in whose hands is the scheduling? Is it the parent? Is it the counselor? Is it the principal? Is it consistent? And I think one of the challenges that our um, high schools face is if I'm a student and I I just I'm the math educator and the basic skills aren't there. To what degree do I keep working on basic skills? foundations of math classes, preparatory classes, how long can I delay it? And I, th I think to me what this says is we really would love our students to have it by eighth grade. That's optimal. Um, we know some students need additional support. We have ninth grade, but then when you also align it with the credits for graduation, they need four credits. We also have to think about math course rigor and getting our students through math one, two, and three. So we you know, there's a lot of pieces to the puzzle, but I think it's safe to say that that 10th grade number, the size of it right. kind of indicates that that's, there may be some students who can still make it and probably need another year, but, but we, our target should be by ninth grade. Although I, I just want, I want to caution a little bit on a couple of things, I, having taught math in high school. The, uh, two things, one, the 138, I would bet a very large number of that 138 are, are um, English language learning students and the reason why they're kept in 10th grade is we're trying to get their English up high enough. And so it's the correct placement for those students and it's not a surprise that that number pretty much matches exactly the percentage of, of English language learner graduates. Mm -hmm. And then the ninth grade number, although it, it, would, it appears that, it, that we're grad scheduling students in the ninth grade. Actually, the, there are students that are in ninth grade for a long time, many years in ninth grade. And so, uh, and often many years taking math one. So uh, they could be 18, but still be a ninth grader taking math one. So I'm actually impressed that the graduation rate is almost 80% for that number, because that's most of our, I, that's the bulk of our students are, are taking it in ninth grade and that fit all those other categories uh, that we know are, are challenging and we're still keeping that number at 80%. That's actually. Well, I but thought your cohort data was yeah. going to screen what he's saying out in his second point. You said this was a cohort so they, of kids it was that were. First time ninth graders. So I think of it. Keep, keep going. But, with, but what he's Mr. saying is some students never got out of the ninth grade. And I'll have a slide actually on that in a little bit. Um, but, there's, but there's another piece of that is that the very best math students take math in eighth grade. So you take that, you take that out of the group. 
and then the ninth grade is the next group of very best students uh, then taken out of the group. So I see what you're saying, and I, the 50% at 10th grade, and these are the students that you are keeping away from math for the longest possible time in order to build up their skills, whether it's arithmetic skills or language skills. I'd just be curious as to whether the data lets you pull it out by first semester, second semester on a block and to see if there was something to be learned from, you know how that transition to ninth grade is such a huge one. Does it, does it help to wait and hit your math in second semester? Or, uh, I would Even the number of high schools now that have, as math is an entire, sem is an entire year long, and whether or not there's a higher graduation rate for that and a higher passing rate for that. Somebody explain to me what missing is 457. What, what, what is that? So those would be students who potentially didn't take math one in Durham public schools. They may have taken um, it someplace else. You were part of, that were part of the cohort. Who they made, so they may have transferred in later. Or they already yeah. had it. Mm -hmm. Okay. And it could be including students who had it, for example, in a private school in middle school. So, so those credits transfer in, but not a score and not a grade level. Right, but we know that all of them had had math, math one. The, or the, the missing, the four fifty. Or the equi or the equivalent. Or the equivalent. Okay. All right. Well, we we don't know if they took it at all, right? And it's to some well, extent we don't have we don't have the information on them. So so in our data set, they never showed up is having taken math one in Durham Public Schools okay. of the cohort. Okay. All right, so that is something we need to start because well, it was well, four. Well, but in order to graduate, they would have had to have <coughs> some equivalent because they had to move on to the next math, right? But I'm just, but, right, and yeah. so they might have had an equivalent, but they wouldn't have had this. They weren't in the data set. They, right. Okay. And so this was looking at where students were in ninth grade and whether or not they graduated. Um, and so it, it gives you information by school. I wanna point out one typo, which is, so it looks like Southern is on here twice, but the second one is actually, I think, so, did you say Southern Engineering? Yeah, so, so, yeah, so engineering. Okay. Well, it's actually, it's the, one, it's the piece that actually closed, yeah. it dissolved, but there were students that would be in that cohort. One of the, results I wanted to point out to this was actually the there's 219 students who were part of the denominator who moved in after after ninth grade or who transferred into school and and those students had a very low graduation rate 43 percent and when we think about the school and district rate as it's reported to the state um, if a student <coughs> transfers into a school um, let's say if it's from a DPS school to another DPS school, but let's say the student transfers in off cohort, that student counts in the district's data, but not in the school's data. Um, if the student transfers in from another county, um, in state, out of state, and they are off cohort, meaning they're not in the grade that they're supposed to be for that cohort, then they do not count against the district um, or the school. So there is grace given for students who, for the rate in terms of a student transferring in off, if they transfer in off cohort. And so that's, that's what she's referring to. And if they come from a charter school in Durham or outside of Durham, do you know? Then, you know, I will double check that, but I'm, I'm pretty sure that it would not count against us because it's related to the LEA rate. Because they didn't take that class in Durham? Because... Um, they're, take, they're taking, the charter school kids are taking the Math 1 test. Oh, we're, we, with this wasn't about Math 1. This was just about their high school in ninth grade. So that's... And the earlier slide that we moved through was this slide at the 12th grade level. So we've given it to you, the cohort as they came in. So they're gonna be pretty similar, but obviously they're gaining and losing students sure. throughout. In this slide, I wasn't really planning on saying too much other than it's just, we just l looked at where the students were in as eighth graders. Um, so some of the students weren't actually in Durham Public Schools in eighth grade, so that's this number. Um, and it's actually sort of interesting. They're slightly ahead, 82.4%. Um, the students who weren't 
who moved back in for high school. Um, but I'll just leave you with this table. So what this slide does is it just looks at our, our cohort of students and so where were they in each of the four years that we were talking about. Um, and so we see that we had about 2,200 of them in ninth grade. Um, this should not actually say yet. It should just say not in DPS. So these 242 hadn't been in there. But the, and so ideally you would be on this, co on this diagonal line. You would just be, you go from ninth to 10th to 11th to 12th. Um, 185 students were were retained in ninth grade, and ninth grade tends to be one of the grades where where students um, are have a high probability of being retained. And what we see, if we look at just those those 185 students who were retained in ninth grade, um, it, it's not surprising because they were just retained, but only 20% of them are going to graduate on time, and 53%, so 99, actually just dropped out of school. Um, and so, so we wanted to look in to see who those students were in a little more detail. Could, um, sorry, before, could you go back two slides? But doesn't that show that we're actually retaining them at a pretty steady rate? Like no, because so. In 10th grade, 195 were. But it's not 195 new ones, right? So it is, there's about 60 students probably retained here, right? Because you add 10 more plus 52. I'll look more at it later. Right. Thank you. Sorry about that. No, that's okay. So can I ask one it's more question? It's a lot of numbers, so I don't mind questions. Yeah, there are. So from 185 to 52 to 18, would that mean that, and if I'm looking at the ninth grade across, that the... So there's 18 students who started out in ninth grade in 2011-12, and they were still in ninth grade in 2014-15. Got it. Okay. The row piece of this is important, like thinking about, so that is your group of who's in ninth grade. Right, and then and some of these students then are moving into this not, not in DPS because they're dropping out of school. So if I wanted to look at, the, sorry, the number of students who dropped out from year to year, can you figure that out? From this slide, you wouldn't be able to figure out who dropped out versus who's still in school. Got it. It would be a little tricky. But remembering kind of to the point earlier that there's still a non-graduate at that point. So they're still not counting in the four-year cohort. It could be that they, for example, um, we have students with severe disabilities who are with us till the age of 21. Um, so they won't have a diploma. Um, they'll have a certificate. They, they really only count against the rate one time for the four-year rate and then one time for a five-year rate. But nevertheless, there are students that are still in school that are also, we know, are going to be non-graduates. It's not all of them, but there are some. And, and so since it's not only just that these students were at risk for not graduating, it's that they, they have a high probability of dropping out. So they're not just they're not just still in school, right, just because they spend an extra year. They're they have a high li risk of leaving school um, without a diploma. And so one of the things that Dr. Spencer had asked us to do um, was just to look to see more in detail as to who these 185 students were. Um, and I think some of the ideas also were how can we start to identi identify these students, identify some of these risk factors, and start to intervene earlier before they leave. Um, and so that's sort of where I I'd like to leave it. Oh, do you want to talk about, you want, yeah. So kind of the highlights of all of that data, kind of thinking about the cohort, um, how many graduated, how many dropped out, um, thinking about the data reflecting the following groups that are graduating at rates lower than the district, black and Hispanic male students, students with disabilities, limited English proficient students, overage students. Those are the ones that um, I think stand out. Thinking about predictors um, as we think about students, what matters in predicting um, graduation attendance, really more strongly at the ninth and tenth grade level, suspension more strongly at the ninth and tenth grade level. Um, when students take Math One and how they do in Math One, um, 
there was not a slide up here, but also thinking about um, the performance of students in grades six through eight, not surprising the relationship, um, as well as I think for me, the, the number one, something we should be working on is thinking about the group of students that are being retained. How do we prevent it? And how do we respond quickly um, when a student finds himself in that situation, kind of thinking about only half of the half of those students are graduating. So to me, that's that's an easy um, kind of focus area for us. Julie, I'm sure you remember um, the Belfan study, Robert Belfans from um, John Hopkins, and how we Duke University and Fairwind decided that if we did that, we would look at Lowe's Grove and we would look at Neil for predictors of students at risk. And we knew at that time, the Belfast study cleared, uh, confirmed this, and this has been at least how many years, Julie? How many years can we say? That, that in the sixth grade, when a kid comes from middle school, comes from elementary school, at the sixth grade year, we're gonna look at attendance, we're gonna look at whether they fail English, whether they fail math. Those are the three things that will determine whether or not what we were supposed, those were the warning signs that let us know right then and there in middle school what we needed to do to make sure that they were successful as they moved on. So I don't think we, 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 keep, we keep getting data, and this is really good. Now we've got, we've really got, you know, hard, figures to go along with it. That's what we didn't have. We had what the signs were, but now we have hard figures to go along with it. So now that we know the predictors that we always knew what the predictors were, um, again, now we want to know uh, what are we going to do with this? And, um, you know, we keep, we're Durham, so we study, 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 research, research, research more and more data, 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 and when the, we, we want to know what we're going to do, do, do. So I think we're at the do, do, do part, okay? And, um, yeah. Well, and, and I completely agree, and I think that is where we are, and I think that we've made great strides um, last year, and I think we're already off to a great start in really partnering with student services, partnering with, um, teaching and learning to, to now, here, here's who, who we have to, to look at. I think um, really two points that came out of, I don't know if you were here when I said this, about we met with our high school graduation teams mm -hmm. yesterday in our large comprehensive um, high schools with the principal, the counselor, the record specialist, the data manager, and anybody, a social worker was also at the table to really set up systems and processes um, and here's your data source. Here's your list of students. Um, what's the status? Here's mm -hmm. students. Here are the lists that matter. We want to see your failure list. We want to see your students who are off cohort. We want to see your students um, who've missed more than 10 days of school. And that's, and here's a sample agenda for how you have that meeting. Here's, um, obviously, each school takes on their own dynamic of how it functions, but some system district processes exactly. and expectations for how that conversation happens. And I, I'm glad to hear you say that, that we're gonna have some consistency okay. in terms of the conversations because we know now, you know, uh, this, this ro rolls all the way down to recruitment. What do we, we need our, some of our strongest teachers in math, math one, and, and um, we need some of our, we need to look at our counselors and making sure that, or whatever the attendance person, making sure, what are we doing when the kids don't come to school? Are we sending these notices to our parents? Are we calling them in and making them accountable for making sure the kids get to school? Um, that suspension data, so I think we got a lot, and I'm glad to know that we're being consistent about it because the, it, it just continues and continues and continues. And uh, we, we need to stop the ball from, the, from rolling down the hill. I can say that it, and we met with our larger high schools, so the small schools that are already sitting on 100% graduation rates, we're having a separate meeting. That's a different conversation. Their systems and processes can be different. Um, and so really focusing on the places where we know um, 
we need to focus. And the uh, overage kids. We need to do something about the overage, the overage and, children. And, I do, I do and we share the research piece with the principals and counselors. I do want to give other board members a chance to ask some questions if they really? do have really? some. Really? So. Um, there are schools that popped up several times. Like if we think about like layering some of this data, right? Like we talked about it a lot separately, but like Southern popped up kind of in the lowest of all of these. And how are we targeting schools? And are we looking at like ACT? They were, if it looked like they were closer to college ready, but yet math one and biology or like the other indicators were very low. So how do we look at all of that together? And then like on a school focused basis? We look at it all together. We've instituted something this year called wraparound services and Southern is one of those schools in which we bring all of their data together and all of the servicing agencies that service Southern. So EC, teaching and learning, the um, assistant superintendent, everyone who works with Southern comes around the table to begin to look at what is the plan, HR is a part of that team, for dealing with and addressing the needs of Southern. But it's not just Southern. We have to look at that feeder pattern of Neil because if we overlay the data of Southern, Neil, and then the elementary feeders, that all has an impact. And so all of those schools are in what we call wraparound services where we have a detailed action plan and a timeline by which certain things have to be done. So that's something that we've brought into place. I just want to remind the, the board, the, the process that we set out at the, at the beginning of the year was to look in the fall carefully at the data. And then the administration is going to come back in the spring ad addressing best practices and what we've learned and with the plan that, that addresses these. So that they're, they're following the, the process that we set out. I'm sorry, I'm getting ahead of that, myself. I, I mean, I, no, no, that's we, good because good. See, what you're asking is what, what Stacy just said is what our community needs to know. See, our community needs to hear what it is, we, what, what it is in place so those parents that have those children that are in that position know exactly what needs to happen if you want to get this kid to graduation. We have to let people know what their responsibility is because otherwise they're just waiting until the 12th grade and say, why didn't you let me know my kid wasn't going to walk? You know, so now, now is the time. I, I do want to just take one second to say, I, I don't want to be Pollyanna about it, but on the other hand, when I started 30 years ago, if, if someone had put that sl graduation slide on the board and said, this is where we're gonna be in 2015, mm -hmm. they would have been laughed out of the room. There was, the, the graduation rate when I started was under 50% mm -hmm. in, in Durham and in the state. So people have done tremendous work to get us this far. It's not where we wanna be, but I don't wanna slight the work that has happened to get us here. And, and, and realistically, to get from 80%, when you look at, especially at the, the, the two numbers that are striking, the, the EC numbers and limited English proficiency numbers, moving those numbers is not going to be an easy thing. Uh, and so the, the challenge is, is great. I don't think we help ourselves if we overlook the work that's already in place that's successful, that is working, that is getting a lot of our students to uh, to graduation. Are there other, other questions from the board? Of course, now when you were getting that book 30 years ago, we, so, it wasn't as complicated. <laughs> so the, I think what, <clears throat> I, I can't talk about this data um, and, and the hurdle that is getting a diploma without also looking at our responsibility for preparing for beyond where we are. And while that's not within our daily purview, it is a critical responsibility of ours. And so this does not undercut it, what I'm about to say does not undercut at all what was presented or the value in looking at that. Um, but I hope in these moments we're also looking at um, the other factors and other measures we can to see how well we're doing at actually preparing kids for life. Um, and so it looks like you're going to tell me how we, we're going to do that. But the, I, can't wait the, to, I can't wait to tell you. Please. But I mean, the, on the negative side, and I don't want to be negative because this was a good data presentation, but just like in the Victor report where we saw inconsistencies across suspensions in between schools, I know we have inconsistencies around what a diploma means in between schools and the level of rigor. 
and that's very real and it's hard to quantify. Um, so that's a factor for me. And then, um, you know, how do we look at data sources like the National Clearinghouse data to see how our kids are doing? And, and you know, those are college-going kids, but that would be a starting place. And that's exactly what I was getting ready to tell you, <laughs> okay. which that is um, actually signed off on today was for us to secure seven years of data um, for National um, Student Clearinghouse so that we can look at our students post high school, um, post secondary. And actually we're partnering with Durham Children's Data Center and they have a few folks there who've done some work with that data set, I think in Chicago. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so we've already started preliminary conversation of what data, you know, what quest research questions do we have um, that we want to see in terms of how are our students doing. And I believe that does connect with community college data. Um, and I don't know exactly how far that goes. Is it, you know, just, is it a, just a degree or is it, a, you know, I know there's some attendance, measures attendance, um, and I think, what is it, persistence, and re th there's some key words that they measure in terms of looking at that. So. That'll be, um, that'll be a future project that we bring back to you and can share um, and will be new for us. And, and our community, Dr. Lum and I have been in many meetings um, where community, our community is really eager to, to see and know that information in terms of how our students are doing. And we may get some criticism in the community that, we, that um, we've been accused of dragging our feet. This was never about dragging our feet. This was about ensuring the confidentiality of the data going forward because Durham Public Schools in their policies had certain um, idiosyncrasies that, didn't, that, don't, that are not in other counties. So we had to work through those issues. We have finally worked through those issues. We signed off, uh, but um, we actually made the decision last year to do this, and it took us this long. I so appreciate the data, and I appreciate many reminding us of the ball fans and how we know it already, but this level of work that you all have done has a, a particular focus that I think really gets us to some action steps that are going on now that I, uh, already, we're not waiting for anything to, to transform things. I wonder, as a partner piece, whether parents really understand how important attendance is and whether we might get Dr. Lum to write another column or something in the coming months, you know, as, as teenagers negotiate attendance with their parents and uh, try to take more of uh, a skipping every once in a while, you know. It is so, so, so critical that they be at school. I mean, so critical. and. I, I never lose an opportunity to talk to parents, and the first thing out of my mouth is about attendance. And if I, and if, when I go speak at PTAs, I always ask the principals what they would like me to say, and the first thing out of their mouth is to talk about attendance. It's very complicated in Durham, um, and I don't know if it, I don't know if we're unique in that, but the, the complications that I hear, especially at the high school level, is that with both parents working or a single parent home. They're off to work. They have, an, they have a ninth grader, who, and they also have a fifth grader. Fifth grader is sick. Ninth grader stays home. So those are the things that I'm hearing a lot of. But even with that, I'm t you know, I think our advice to parents is that they got to be in school. The data is very clear that the more they're in school, the better they're going to do. Well, and the correlation to graduation is profound. I mean, if you could share that data with parents, just. But can, can I ask, yeah. answer another? Th um, add, this is now. Uh, Responding to your question, Ms. Byer, but you know when um, I think it was many say, "Well, what are you doing?" You know, and and Dr. Stacy Wilson Norman says, "Yes, and this is what we're doing. Mm -hmm. This is not what we're good at: is letting people know that this is the plan, this is the intervention, this is the strategy. It is focused. It is based on data, and it's evidence driven. So, I mean, those are the kind of things that we need to do to be able to be better at." in getting those kind of words out. I just wanted to go back to the um, conversation about, or the comment about scheduling. Um, as we are encouraging parents to really help us with the attendance piece, the same helicopter parents that were over those fifth graders and third graders relax when their kids oh, finally, they in high school, and then when they get a car, and I'm telling you, they relax, <laughs> and, and just anecdotal, they're not looking at the progress from 9 to 12. Parents aren't 
by and large, aren't really involved as much as I think they should be in scheduling. So as we're telling them, send that kid to school, I also would like to remind them to stay on top of the, the schedule and, and look at it as a four-year thing, not a, what are you taking this year? What are you taking this year? Because that's the wrong way to approach it. I would also add in thinking about the scheduling, and, and Dr. McLean and I just had this conversation, which is thinking out of the box about scheduling. So if we know this is true about a student who's retained in ninth grade, what happens? Then what are the options available? You know, um, zero period, a period on the end of the day, night, weekend. I mean, we, we, we can, we don't have to always do the same thing schedule for every student. There may be other opportunities um, to vary, um, you know, the schedule for students so that when this happens, we get it very quickly so that they do not fall into a pattern, of, especially think about students who don't have block schedule opportunity. And so if I'm retained, um, you know, it, it's really, I'm not catching up Till two, at least two years down the road. And so I think that thinking with our principals about scheduling and um, making sure we know who those students are and kind of what is the plan of action is important and including parents in that. I mean, I think you're exactly right. But can I add? <laughs> the conversations that we've had in the last couple of days around my table is, is around those kinds of additional splinter, you know, um, interventions. But every one of those interventions, and we know what they are, and we know that they could work, but every one of those interventions take people, take resources, and take money. And we are, we are um, already beginning to look at the 2017-18 school year, and it's not about expanding. So that, um, but I would like to have that conversation on down the line too, and I think that some of that will come out in the um, um, in our budgeting committees, and and when we talk about that, because there is great need, and there is capacity and expertise in Durham Public Schools to address the great needs, but it's it's going to take additional resources. I think we can get it. So thank you. Uh, Board members, I believe if you talk to Dr. Spencer later, she can sign your CEUs and statistics. <laughs> you should get a board CEU yes. out of this one. <laughs> uh, I think that, a series. that, yeah, yeah, you do have to come back next time to finish. Uh, I think that gets us through. Uh, it was only two items on the agenda. Uh, we, do you have follow-up items? I do. Um, Gathering the trend data for our English language learners for graduation, um, the contract that we use for the extra agencies for interpreters, SAT percentages, and IB takers at Hillside. Can I add one thing? There are a couple of numbers in the slides that were off. Can we make this get updated? Uh huh. Mm hmm. percentage one that you said that you're going to send them. Uh -huh. The percentage of SAT. Yeah, let's get that posted on the, the board. Right, we have a great record keeping system yet. So it, keeps, it gets fixed in the packet. Thank you. Yes. Anything else? Uh, make a motion. I think we need a motion to move into closed session. I make so a motion. Moved. Yes. <laughs> on the agenda. Second. Okay. Uh, uh, all in favor say aye. Aye. <laughs> Opposed? All right. Thank you so much. Thank you all. That was really helpful.
Okay, we're now back in open session. No, we're not. Oh, now we are. Oh, yeah. yeah. I forgot the signal, but he's signaling. He, he got it. We got the greatest uh, AV people. So, all right. Mr. Chair, members of the board, you have the personnel roster for your approval dated December 1st, 2016. Second. It's been moved and properly seconded that we approve the personnel report for December 1st, 2016. Discussion? All in, hearing none, all in favor say aye. Aye. All opposed, please use the same sign. It passes unanimously. Thank you. We are now adjourned. Thank you.